start off by saying it's an honor to be here to speak at this conference. It's uh, been an amazing week. I've spent time with some amazing people. You do not hear sounds. You don't hear the microphone. No sound in the microphone. Can you hear now? It's better. Okay, so yeah, it's been an amazing week for me. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to each and every one of you to uh, that you've come here to share your experiences with each other, and, and I'm really grateful for that. And once again, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, before I get into my presentation on vibration, uh, I'd like to see if we can maybe tune the room up. Maybe we can do a group home. Yeah, I think maybe the French people will be able to, to understand this and. Uh, Maybe this language of vibration uh, can bring us closer together for this presentation. So what I want to do is a series of three breaths. We're going to breathe in, and then we're going to breathe out, and then we're going to own. We're going to do that three times, and I want this to be uh, representative of mind, body, and spirit. And then on the other side of that, I also want it to be representative of vibration, oscillation, Spin. Okay. So we'll start. I have this uh, to tune up. So maybe you guys hear that? Okay. So let's start. So breathing in.
Okay, so here I am with uh, a couple of my teachers. The one on the right is Dale Pond, and um, he continued with John Worrell Keeley's work. Uh, he's devoted 30 years of his life to studying John Worrell Keeley's work, and here he is standing in front of his uh, model of John Worrell Keeley's etheric motor device. And uh, this device is uh, tuned in a specific way to be able to receive celestial radiation and it's able to balance with terrestrial radiation. And uh, he was able to basically disassociate water, or release hydrogen from water into the sphere and create motion. And so it's a form of an etheric motor. But we won't go too much into that. That's just kind of a quick little idea. Um, you guys can, I'll give you some information. You guys can research more into that. Okay, so at the Pond Science Institute, uh, we believe everything in the universe vibrates and oscillates perpetually. In fact, everything is nothing other than these vibrations and oscillations in different combinations. We study the physics of these vibrations and oscillations to better understand how we and the universe works. So just to catch you up again on cymatics, it's the study of visible sound and vibration. It's a subset of model phenomena. Typically, the surface of a plate, diaphragm, or membrane is vibrated. And regions of maximum and minimum displacement are made visible in a thin coating of particles, paste, or liquids. Now, in my research, um, I'm very, very connected to water. For some reason, water has been my working medium quite some time. And so naturally, I went right for the water medium. So I built a series of imaging devices, and over time, um, I refined a way to capture vibration in its most organized, purest form. As you can see here, I have a frequency generator, amplifier, and here's a ring light, LEDs, perspective lighting. There's me wiring up the LED lighting. I had to teach myself this, it wasn't very easy. <laughs> um, and then there's a speaker box here, and the sound is basically projected into water, and I catch the vibrating water and the refraction of the light on the water. And so I'm going to take you through a series of images, six of them in total, all of which were caught within about um, a time window of three seconds, and they're in sequential order. So here's the first image of the six. And as you can see, it looks much like a nautilus shell, almost like a spiraling galaxy. And from what I understood when I first went at this, because, you know, this was earlier in my understanding of vibratory physics. So, what I understood is that we're vibrating the vessel of water, and the water starts to collapse in on itself, and it expands and it collapses in on itself. And so what happens is, it starts to polarize. And this is the point here where it's beginning to polarize. And so it started to find an equilibrium. And as you can see, it looks much like a yin yang. And when I saw that, and you know, I've been practicing qigong for, for quite some time, and I was like, oh, the yin yang, you know, I found it. And it was right there in my face. And so I felt like, wow, like all that meditation and, 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 and moving into this type of science, I was just like, I found it connecting so much to me. It affected me so deeply that I will never turn back. And as you can see, that polarity starts to split into two. And from two comes three. And from three is a full expression sound through water. 
It's hexagonal in nature. And as I understand it, it's like an amplification in a sense of the structure of water molecule. Now, this last image here, I kept the shutter speed open a little bit longer. So what I did, I was able to capture more vibrations within that time period of the image being taken. And so it still is six, sorry, it still is six fold in symmetry. But you can see as the image danced around, it kind of went through this interchange process of its expansion and contraction. It started to express what I thought I was seeing was the five plutonic solids here in the center of the image. So I thought to myself, man, I could see so many symmetries and so much geometry in this. I have to learn how to be able to understand it deeper. So I taught myself sacred geometry to be able to better understand this vibratory energy. I got some really classic books, teaches you from 1 to 12, the correct way to do sacred geometry. And it's a series of books by Michael Schneider. I highly recommend these books. And he teaches you like you're in grade school, like a little kid, he takes you from 1 to 12, and you build models, and it's very easy, even a child can do it. And, but it's done in the correct order. So this can be very simple or it can be very advanced. So once equipped with this tool, I started to do overlay images on top of the vibratory work. And my first extrapolation to me, it was representative of a simple molecule. Three out of molecule representing, for example, water. And as you can see, overlaid on the vibratory work, it's a perfect match. And in these workbooks, they also teach you how to build a cosmological circle. Cosmological circle, as I understand it, with my interpretation, interpretation being the main word, is representative of all the celestial energy radiating from the solar system to the center of the Earth and back. Once again, it was a perfect match to me. And you can see how the terrestrial and the celestial come together and match with this vibratory image. And what I was starting to understand that maybe this vibration was representative of ether or a quantum level state of energy that exists within the universe. So I went a step further and I taught myself how to extrapolate these geometric images into harmonics. As you can see here is a full octave. This is a two-dimensional image, but it's also representative as a sphere. And you can see the harmonic fifths. And breaking into thirds as well. Once again, I started noticing that these geometries were lining up in the nodal points of the vibratory image. And when I say nodal points, I mean places within the image that are empty. Yeah. 
So having starting to then researching Healy's work, whom my teacher has been researching for many years, Healy worked with musical spheres in a musical model of the universe. Basically the classic music of the spheres model. So I started seeing that this vibratory work had a musical nature to it, a harmonic nature. So I went a step further, and I wanted to see where, what, the, what the pendulum type function of this energy flow is. And from there, when I, when I was imaging this, these photos, when I was imaging these photos, I noticed that as this interchanging expansion and contraction was occurring, the images would slightly turn like a dial. So I knew there was some type of spin happening within this expansion and contraction function. So I went ahead and I extrapolated the vibratory work as a continuous spinning motion model. And please forgive my terminology, I'm doing my best. I will be showing you um, videos from my teacher very shortly that has very concise terminology that takes vibratory physics and matches it with conventional physics terminology. So maybe some of the people that understand physics on a higher level from a conventional standpoint may be able to better understand my interpretation. So I noticed within this spinning, ratcheting, this continuous motion model, it builds. So I basically went around one time and I came up with 360, 360 degrees. We all know that. But then I went around again and I got to 720. And then I went around again. I got to 1080. And I had been researching that factoring in mathematics is a comprehensive way to understand the reverse side of how we understand the way mathematics works. Once again, interpretive. And so, as you can see, within the factory process, 6 plus 3 is 9. 7 plus 2 is 9. 8 plus 1 is 9. Same thing over here. 3, 9, 10, 11, 12. 2 plus 1 is 3. Etc. So I started to notice that there was this anomaly where 3, 6, and 9 were lining up with the vibratory work at the points of the geometry. And so I started seeing two qualities of information occurring. The three, six, nine, the one, the two, and the four and the five. And perhaps three qualities. <coughs> and then I went a step further and I started learning a little more about pyramids. And so I overlaid the heptagon on top of the 
vibratory extrapolations, the geometric extrapolations. And lo and behold, I found myself a pyramid. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some video modules from my teacher who will take you into the world of vibratory physics based on his research of multiple scientists, multiple occult etheric scientists from the late 1800s. At the Pond Science Institute, almost everything we research is from the late 1800s. Before science had changed forever. And so I hope that this is not too technical, but gives you some better understanding from a technical viewpoint. And so in reference to this, there's another scientist named Walter Russell. Walter Russell was a theoretical artist, scientist, mathematician. He was, he was a, a Renaissance man, much like much of us and the scientists who have come. And so he is explaining the process of polar interchange from Walter Russell's work. This uh, document that I've been working on originated as a Walter Russell paper about his optic dynamo generator. It's a fascinating device. His intent was to collect and concentrate um, force in such a way that this thing would drive, pretty much drive itself. So my effort was to take his original paper, which I found brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and annotate it according to what I understood Russell meant and some of the things that Keeley did. And as I did that, it was very clear that Keeley's laws of vibration physics exactly addressed what Russell was writing about. So while Russell hit all the high points on what his dynamo generator was doing and how it did it. He didn't really explain it. But using Keeley's laws, we get a very dynamical insight into what's actually taking place. So this paper is basically uh, in three parts. There's the intro, which pretty much explains what I just said. Then there's a short piece about the optic dynamo generator. But the vast bulk of the paper explains the principles by which this optic dynamo generator functions. And we don't really need to go into those principles in this video. We can leave those for another video <clears throat> where we talk about the explicit principles and laws that govern what Russell called rhythmic balanced interchange, which drives pretty much every rotary system in the universe, whether it's a galaxy or a sun or a planet going around a sun, or the orbits of atoms and molecules. The principles are all the same. So we'll get into those at a later date. But just to touch upon it a little bit, the idea is to accumulate force to a point and then differentiate that force into a kinetic energy. The first part is done through sympathy or sympathetic vibration, commonly referred to as quantum entanglement, where these particles are harmonized and they start to self-organize into smaller and smaller, more energetic volumes. And when these reach a certain point, which I call the critical tension point, Russell called it the four plus plus point, um, the energy builds up through resonance to such a point that spontaneous harmonics are formed, these create a discord, and the discord between particles drives them apart. So it's the same process as cavitation, only in a more organized, better understood 
format. So this is a series of modules. Um, being a producer editor of using documentary, part of my research has been documenting <laughs> Dale's work and my work. And so we're starting to get into this model of expansion and contraction here. Much like I noticed with the vibratory work of cymatics. So let's continue on with part two because we wouldn't want to leave you hanging. If you follow the links in the paper to the SVP wiki, these terms are either defined or shown how they're used. And so anyone who takes the time can follow the links and get a pretty good grasp of what Russell was talking about. Well, the key element in his dynamo generator is where do you get the energy? And once you get it, how do you regenerate it? So you always have a power source to drive this device. <clears throat> so the whole key is what is this power regeneration and how does it work and can we do all that with it? And according to what we were able to understand from it and from Keeley's work especially, uh, yeah, you, you can you attract this, this energy, you accumulate it into a volume, and then you compound that by making it a smaller volume, which is more compact. The denser the material that you start with, the more energy you get to work with. And that's done through the process of uh, harmonization of the quantum entities that we're dealing with. In this case, light, that's why it's an optic device. A light device concentrates light, but not physical photonic light. It's the light of the Akashic or scalar forces or whatever you want to call it. The luminiferous ether, for lack of another term. They're all quantum entities and they all have energy. And you can accumulate these according to the harmonization brought to bear on them. Think in terms of quantum entanglement and uh, boson pairs, for instance, or compounds of boson pairs. That's what you wind up with. And it's a high energetic state. Well, if you want to cause an attraction between two distant bodies, whether it's this distance or 10 miles, they need to be harmonized, which is to say brought into the same unison. So they vibrate at the same pitch, the same period. And depending on how far you want to go with that process, you would also tune for the secondary and tertiary harmonics or overtones in each of those bodies. Keeley one time made the comment that tuning forks, the best tuning fork you could buy, was only in tune by one fortieth, which meant if you wanted to be truly in tune, you would tune for the harmonics and overtones, like a piano player does, a piano tuner does. You know, they'll listen for the higher overtones and they'll, they'll tune those in and out as they go up the keyboard. So we could do the same thing with uh, quantum entities, and they would collapse together, they would self-mutually attract and collapse and concentrate. At some point in this process, the uh, feedback resonance would start to build within these particles. In other words, the amplitude just gets bigger and bigger and bigger because everybody's marching to the same amplitude, so to speak, like soldiers on a bridge. Those tones will build uh, such an amplitude that they will start breaking down into secondary and tertiary harmonics. And those secondary and tertiary harmonics creates the discord which is the beginning of the transformation of that which you brought together. And as that pro progresses, the progression of these discords, then you go, then the process becomes one of dispersion. Lots of pressure being released, lots of expansion going on, until the amplitudes drop off again, go back to zero over a period of time, or you're back to the zero inertial plan as Russell called it. And the regeneration process is when that concentrated energy is caused to disperse. So we concentrate it and disperse it. And then we concentrate it again. So there's your regeneration. So it's a cycle. Rhythmic balanced interchange. And an analogy. 
Let me give you an analogy. Um, modern science is based on using heat as an energy source. So we'll take a chunk of wood, for instance, and we'll burn it. And burning actually means disassociating the molecular material, the wood, into atomic and plasma material, which is what flame is. Of course, you've got the heat and the light coming out of it, too. So first, the tree had to concentrate the elements from the earth and the elements from the air, light, water, etc., gases. And it brought it into a compact form, which is wood. And uh, depending on the tree, you know, pine trees don't have much energy in it because it's not a very dense wood. But an oak tree is very dense, it has a lot more heat than pine wood does. So we have options and flexibility as to how we want to concentrate those similar elements into a chunk of wood, so to speak, an artificial construct. And then we release it by disassociating those molecular structures, just like you're burning a chunk of wood. The document part two goes into a lot of the process of how to do that, but the general description of that process is in this paper. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea of how the polar interchange process works throughout the universe. So, you know, back to the cymatics work and the vibratory imaging. I'm going to play you a video of 22 hertz, and you'll actually start to see the polar interchange take place within the vibratory video. So, I don't know how good your eyes are, but if you can see, at a very high rate of speed, it's expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting. And over time, it starts to build harmonics, and it expands into a more complex waveform. And if I go ahead and maybe stop on one frame, you can see the triune nature. of the image, three forces, expansion, contraction, and neutral. Okay. So then I started playing with light from an artist's perspective, from an artist's expression. I just wanted to see what I could do with light. So I started trying to match this light up with my geometric images. And perhaps set them in orientation to certain directions. A lot of this work for me was spiritual, so every time that I did an experiment like this, I put my intention into it. So I set up an energy field with my intention for peace, for healing, for love, for thanks, gratitude, everything to make this planet a better place. Here's a piece of art that I call the peace lamp. Would you guys rather uh, learn about vibrations creating harmonics, or do you want to learn about ether? Because I only have two minutes. So here. Okay, so we're going to learn about vibrations creating harmonics. This is the last two modules. An interesting and, and a very important aspect of vibration work is the fact that vibrations create harmonics. So any sound, for instance, a guitar string, if you strike a guitar string, uh, it will sound its fundamental pitch, and it will also sound harmonics and partials. Um, these are important. People don't take those, these partials into consideration. But when you're doing a very carefully and very precisely set up experiment using vibration, those 
ignored harmonics and partials can totally mess up what you're trying to do because they influence uh, vibratorily whatever it is you're doing. And it might be a very minor influence. Uh, for instance, how important it is. Uh, Keeley used tuning forks in, in a lot of his work, and he said that the best tuning fork that you could buy on the market was only in tune by one fortieth. And I believe what he meant by that was the partials and harmonics of that tuning fork were not tuned. They just went for the bass tone, like 256 or whatever it was, and they ignored all of the harmonics and partials. Now, a very good piano tuner will take into account those partials and harmonics, because if he doesn't, the instrument as a whole is going to, it's not going to sound the way you really want it to sound. So those who understand the, the, the fundamental tone of the string and that they have these harmonics and partials, they are important to take into consideration to the degree that you figure they're going to play into your experimental work. In uh, piano tuning, it's like the second, third harmonic that the guy takes into consideration. In Keeley's work, he looked at all 40 of them. And there's probably a whole lot more, there are a lot more. But 40 was enough for him for what he was doing. And the way these partials and harmonics work is any tone that you sound, let's say two cycles per second, which is a real low pitch, they will naturally break into their strongest harmonics, which are a power of two, so 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. And it'll go on up until the sound power diminishes. Just because you can't hear the sound doesn't mean it's not there. What happens also is additive and subtractive synthesis. These frequencies will add to each other and they will subtract from each other. And it's from this naturally occurring overtone series that we derive our music scale. And it derives it through this additive and subtractive process. So if we sound two and four, they will add together and create six. And it's going to automatically divide, so you wind up with three. So if this was C and this was C1, then this would be G in the middle. And likewise, 3 plus 5, you get 8. 3 plus 4, you get 7. And they start filling in these notes. I don't have that chart here to present to you. It's on my wiki. Where it shows how these numbers break out. One note will fill an entire chart of a music scale. 